Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jill, and tonight um, Andrew and Chad are going to take us through our latest structured note, which is a fixed income note, and it's the BBVA e commerce note. Um, for those of you who would like a more comprehensive understanding of structured notes, drop a note in the chat and then we will connect with you after the session to set up a time. In this session, it's important that you have a clear understanding of the product, so don't be shy um, on any of those questions that you might have. So just the general housekeeping. Remember that we don't provide advice. The session is product information only, and we always encourage you to do your own research and do due diligence before making a decision to invest. We're also happy to chat to advisors. So if you do have an advisor that would like to chat to us, let us know. And then past performance is no indication of future performance. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who is going to start. Thanks, Joel. Hello, everybody. Um, from an unusually warm Cape Town. And uh, we decided to try a few different things in this particular um, webinar presentation. Um, I didn't have to bend their arms, but I said I wanted cartoons. So there are a couple of cartoons that are going to pop up during the course of this. So, yeah, that's the famous Winnie the Pooh uh, looking for his favorite nectar, honey. Um, interesting as a play on words here in a bear market he is a bear but we certainly are in very volatile times i'm not going to spend too much time on the headwinds that we've uh, that we've been facing since literally the beginning of the year pretty much in all the webinars we've presented some doom and gloom kind of pictures in terms of the stresses and the and, and the pressures that investors economies democracies you name it are facing and I think this slide pretty much says it all. We, we are forcing our way along as best as we can. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to dwell too long on this. But before we leave the slide, what we've looked at um, in listening. terms of listening. what we've looked at in terms of trying to find the best fit for our investors and our community is to find the right themes that resonate and make sense in terms of for example, these headwinds that we're facing. I've said in all the webinars, the last two years have been very weird years in terms of the pandemic, how we've reacted, how we've responded. And we've been left with changed behaviors and attitudes. And some of those changed behaviors and attitudes are reflecting in our underlying baskets, which we put together with the investment bank in a very concrete way in terms of, does it make sense to the investment bank? Does it make sense to you? Now, one of the things that we've been looking at is he has another one, you know, finding Nemo, we all know, but we're looking for finding, we're looking to find yield. So in a way, my presentation is in two parts. Okay, Chad is going to dive a little deeper into the actual uh, facts and features of the actual product, how it works to a large degree, which most of you may have seen, but also the metrics in terms of when does it open, when does it close, uh, some salient dates, some, some pertinent information. Mine is in two parts. The first part is that we've been asked by so many clients that they're looking for yield. They're not looking specifically for growth. They're looking for cash flow. Um, so when I sat down um, with IDATR structures, I started thinking, where does one look for yield and where is yield coming from currently or not coming from? So traditionally we have, and we're going to go into each sector this cash that we'll look at, we'll look at bonds, which is normally a place, an asset class, and a place where people have gone to find yield. Sorry, sorry Andrew. And thirdly, yes. Andrew, sorry, you're yeah. moving your hands. You, your microphone is making a funny, scrapey noise. So, yeah, I'll bring it a little bit closer. Is that better? No, it's your not the sound. It's, it's scratching. On your shirt. Yeah, on the shirt. So, on your shirt, is, oh. is scratching. Okay, how's that? We can't, we can't hear you nasty. Okay. Is that better? better? Yes. I have to, to derobe. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> everybody will need a glass of wine then. Um, okay, so finding yield, typically cash, bonds, and high income funds and, that, and those type of instruments. So the next three slides I'm going to spend a bit of time on is really having a look at what people earn in cash. People have been sitting on the sidelines and a lot of people have been sitting on the sidelines because they are nervous of what's happening with a war, inflation, recession, volatile markets. They're all with it. Those are the headwinds. 
So let's look at look at let's have a look at cash investors. If you are sitting in cash, and I'm talking about dollars and sterling here, we've taken those as a key metrics because that is the currencies that this product is presented in. It's got two currencies, dollars and sterling. So let's have a look at this. There's two parts to the slide, the top and the bottom, the blue and the green. Very simple. I've taken two very well-known you know, international global banks, NatWest, the top left, and HSBC on the top right. NatWest in dollars, HSBC in GBP. If you had a fixed-term deposit, you can read this for yourselves, and you're probably scanning all over the show. One year, 10,000 to 20,000, that's generally the, 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 the limits, the tiers. 0.25, not even a quarter of a percent per annum for quite a lot of money, $20,000 sitting on the sidelines earning 0.22. Not fantastic. And if you really have to crank it up and put a naught behind each of those figures, you know, 250 to 500, you're only getting 0.27. So not very good. Maybe it's the dollar that's misbehaving. Let's have a look at sterling. Same sort of numbers, same sort of figures, 1.85 for, for that period for 10,000 to 20,000. And 1.9, you're getting zero, you're getting five basis points where you are incrementally multiplying everything by 10. So my takeaway from this is cash is not king in this environment. It hasn't been. And that's simply as a result of what has been happening with low, low central bank rates. Banks can't offer you good rates because the central bank has had this zero or near zero central bank rate. That is moving. Interest rates are moving up. But it moves up very, very slowly. And what the banks give you back is actually quite meager. So clients who are sitting or customers or investors who are sitting in cash are missing golden opportunities. I mean, these are fixed term. These are great banks. These are A-rated banks and in financial institutions. This particular product in the green versus cash box, this is a straight boxing match. I've used the same numbers, a 10,000 and a 10,000 in, in, in sterling and dollars. Those are the yields that is contractually underwritten by this bank. In other words, there's a legal obligation to pay you that per annum. Okay, Chad will take you through some of the more specifics of it, but it is guaranteed. It is not conditional on any of those underlying companies that we're going to talk about because that's what the bank's interested in. We're interested in this yield. That's what we want. That's what our customers and our clients and the investor wants. He wants to get yield out, finding Nemo, finding yield. There's a little bit of a blurb at the bottom there, and I just must explain it. I've tried to present this equally because a fixed-term deposit on the top section is one year. This particular note, okay, is guaranteed for one year to produce those numbers. In fact, it's guaranteed to produce it for its full term, which is four years. Chad will show you the term. But after 12, at 12 months and quarterly thereafter, it could auto-call, and that is the only um, significant situation that will interrupt the flow of coupon. So potentially, if those underlying companies don't auto-call, they don't auto early mature, this could run for four years at fixed guaranteed cash. The only other risk is, is that the issuing bank, for some other reason, goes insolvent. You know, so that is why, as, as Joel mentioned, we only use tier one A-grade banks, um, highly fiscal, highly regulated jurisdictions, good track record, great management team. And this is a bank that's probably the 15th or 16th largest investment bank in the world. So cash is not working. I've, I've shown this. Let's go to the next slide and have a look at the next asset class that we're trying to debunk the, the, th the thinking about. So a lot of clients look at investing in the stock market, investing in quality companies, and Andrew, taking the you're dividend. Really, Andrew, you're really scratching your microphone, dude. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this then. And I'm going to do a strip. This has never happened on Cashbox. Here we go. <laughs> go, Andrew. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> right. Um, so they'll invest in a company that's going to pay them a dividend. So again, the slides in two parts. Uh, FTSE 100 companies on the left in sterling and S&P 500 companies on the right in US dollars. Some of those names, as you scan through them, are household names um, in, in both sides of the slide. You know, whether it's British American Tobacco, Vodafone, Lloyds Banking Group, Glaxo, SmithKline, British Telecoms, Unilever, the list goes on. The same on the other side, um, you know, really AT&T, Philip Morris, IBM, Ari's Capital, Altria. 
there are the last recorded, and this is XX Morningstar research, as of the 31st of May, these are the top producing dividends. Now, you must understand, so this is a per annum yield paid. So that's fine. Let's take Imperial Brands. They make Marlboro, and it's a cigarette company. Actually, it's quite interesting because within this, you'll see Imperial Brands, British American Tobacco, Philip Morris, and Altria, top right on the top, uh, top three on the right hand side, all, all cigarette companies. So, some taxes are, you know, and some companies are still going very strongly, but they pay a high dividend. Um, well, if you can call this high. So, this is cash that's paid out on a quarterly basis, but this is the percentage yield per annum. So, Many clients will say, well, okay, they're well-known companies, they're household names, they'll be okay, and I would like to get this yield out. You must remember that the yield is always based on what the underlying capital is valued, because these are companies listed on the stock exchanges, so their share price goes up and down. The yield rides on the back of that share price. So if the share price is going up, happy days, because your value of your capital is going up as well. If it's going the other way, and there's a slide that we'll show you shortly, there can be a problem. There's a secondary problem, which was demonstrated very effectively during 2020. During 2020, the pandemic came along. Nobody knew where that mine shaft was going to end. It was a plummet straight down um, in terms of valuations. The world thought, we thought the world thought it was going to end. And many companies who are bought simply because of their dividend yield, not for growth purpose, but for dividends. They simply said, we are not going to pay a dividend anymore. And it's within their right not to. They had to protect the shareholders, their balance sheet, their profit and loss balance sheet. They had to protect staff. They had to protect the existence of the company because everybody thought, well, this is it. You know, we're going back into the dark ages. So suddenly a client who's sitting, not in cash, he's sitting in this particular space, he's invested in a company, no protection, he's just looking for the yield. Suddenly that dries up. No cash flow, big problem. That was a consistent theme through 2020. Companies protected themselves. The other issue where I'm very concerned and nervous about, and I, I always warn clients about where their capital values can go. We've taken the top two companies on each side of the dollar and sterling uh, spreadsheet uh, slide here, and we're going to show you now what has happened to them in the last few years. So, if you'd like to move to the next slide, I've called it top of the pops versus capital values. Um, who's driving? Oh, there we go. No, there we go. Right. So, top of the pops, we saw them just now top two in sterling, top two in dollars. Um, What's happened to the underlying capital value? It's all very well getting a yield, but what's happened to the yield that you're getting your, uh, what's happened to the capital value you are getting your yield of? So I've called it top of the pops. This is over a five-year period. I think a five-year period is fair because it's taken into account uh, that period before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and well, we kind of into the hangover period now. Right, interesting. Three of the companies tracking very, very closely together, all tracking downwards. Okay, Imperial Brands, British American Tobacco, those are both cigarette companies, and Lumen Technologies with telecommunications. Ari's Capital, the one that's done a slightly different, uh, said slightly different behavior, um, is a business, uh, it's, it's literally like a, a private equity company on steroids. Okay, it provides business capital for startups. But you can see how badly they were affected in 2020. I mean, they li literally fell out of bed by a huge, huge percentage, as opposed to the other three who just trundled downwards. But if you'd invested, you know, 27, end of 2017 into these three, four companies, your capital value, sure, you're getting these dividends. Look what your capital has decreased to on the right-hand side, Imperial Brands down nearly 50%. This was live as that uh, June the 3rd when I was working, it was a weekend. Um, British American Tobacco down nearly 36%. Lumen over 55%. Aries Capital actually up. I think they're much they're a more volatile company. Um, and hence they, they they pinball around a little bit differently. But the yields that we showed on the previous page, you're working on a lower value. 
Okay, so your actual real value of money is less. So people who are sitting in cash, this is my second leg of the argument that I'm trying to destroy. People who are sitting in cash aren't doing very well. People who are sitting in quality companies, which they are, are losing capital, have lost capital value if they invested over a five-year period five years ago. Yeah, sure, their dividends are okay at the risk of them being stopped. So um, uh, the dividend play is has risk attached to it. Just remember, there's no protection on your capital here. Very different to a note. Structured notes always have a capital value that is built in and protected. Chattel, Chattel alluded to that. I mentioned that. So if we go to the third slide now, my third, my sort of third leg of the boxing match, where I'm trying to destroy a yield. Okay, I've taken a combination here of what do, um, for example, what do high income funds, UK Treasury bond, or ten year gilt? Okay, because these are pretty safe. Okay, let's. There's the the note that we're presenting on the top line: twelve percent in US dollars, eleven point two percent. This is per annum numbers, eleven point two. So we've seen those before. US I bond. Um, if anybody hasn't heard of an I bond, the I stands for not investment or income. It's actually inflation. So it's linked to the inflation rate in the U US. So inflation has been pretty low until recently, and only now it shot up. Um, so this looks oh nine point six. That sounds attractive. It's backed by the U.S. government. It's the federal government, so quite a lot of security. The same goes for the last two, the U.K. Treasury bond and the U.K. I beg your pardon, the U.S. Treasury bond and the U.K. guild. Those are backed by the central government. So your capital pretty much is, it's a different story to what we were saw in the previous slide, more secure here. But let's go back to the bond. Um, you know, it's, for example, you can only invest $10,000 a year in it. Okay, that's there's a limitation. It's got rules and regulations. Um, it should be kept for five years plus. If you come out, and but you can come out after a year. But if you come after a year, you lose twenty five percent of what it's earned. So it's got it's got bells and whistles. It's not as simple as it seems, but it is there. Again, have a look at it in terms of eleven point two or twelve. A high income fund. The high income fund. This is actually um, the anomaly here is that it's a this is a sector median in the US, okay? Um, in other words, I've taken the sector average across a five-year period, and it worked out around about 25 points, 25, just under 26%. The average per annum is 5.2, okay? That's net of fees, by the way, okay? And bond funds and income funds differ in terms of their makeup, in terms of what they charge. These are, this is a net of, I don't want to get too technical, but you can see how it decreases. So. Let's go and say, right, we're going to support the U.S. government in terms of its infrastructure bill, building roads and railways and harbors and airports and you name it. They'll give you just under 3% for a 10-year treasury bond, okay? And the U.K. is even less at 2.2. To give some, um, I suppose, equanimity to this, um, interest rates are rising. So you will see some of these percentages do start pushing up to the ceiling. For the last two years, um, they've been chronically low as the governments of the world have just pumped, pumped money into the system to try and keep the system breathing, to try and keep the patient alive and to recover it. So these type of, these type of returns you're seeing on the top lines, right through these asset classes that are not delivering for any clients, quite frankly, are not in the retail market. Retail investors simply cannot get their hands on these. This is an institutional type of return. Um, and cash box, that is simply the area in which we operate with our partner IDAT on this. So let's have a look. So that's the destruction, as I call it. There's no, there's no happy um, slide on this. Uh, that comes right at the end. I think Jill has that opportunity to present that one. And just keep in mind Winnie the Pooh. He was my idea. Okay. So... Moving on to the next slide. What is the underlying, in, in, every, in all of our investments, we have a theme. There's a thematic that we believe resonates with what is going on in the world right now. I mentioned the headwinds, not going to dwell on that. The stresses, strains, and the pressures we're facing. And you'll see, and, and just stay on the slide for a moment. You'll see in the next slide, though how the four companies during the last two very weird years, as I call them, did fantastically well. They were certainly darlings. They did very, very well. But the fundamentals are right. E-commerce is simply a, a space now where 
uh, people have migrated to online digital sales, online payment portals, the futuristic worlds we live in. More and more sales are coming about through um, uh, literally anything from buying a, a motor car online to buying uh, tissues online to buying food online. You name it, it's bought through an e-portal. And these companies are all in this e-portal sort of situation. And I think the economic and social lockdowns that we had in the last two year, uh, sorry, the last two, two years, reinforced the trend. And it's a mega trend. We reinforced the trend that we were on that e-commerce is here to stay. Sure, shops will exist on the main main high streets. Malls will continue. Companies will continue building malls as well. But I think for obvious reasons, massive, massive revenues now are generated from the stay-at-home, work-at-home type of scenario where people can go online any time of the day and buy something in a jurisdiction that is not theirs, different time zone, different demographic, you name it. It's, an ad, it's, it's really our, it's a further adaptation of what life is going to be like post, post the pandemic. Um, and I think if you look at the numbers that these companies produce during that really strict, rigid time, they were quite staggering. And simply, yes, they've come off in massive values. Um, so if you look at you know, the, the type of companies we're looking at, have a look at this slide. And then when, when Jill flicks to the next slide, you'll see um, very similar trends in terms of those graphs. Okay, so what happened there? You can see the dates. Um, the dates are very clear. Um, during the pandemic period, did very, very well. So what does that mean for the bank who's underwriting this? They are writing this as a guarantee. This is guaranteed income. It's like that fixed deposit. So what are they looking at when they analyze a slide like this? They're looking, let's have a look what it did before 2020 and where is it now? Because what it did during those two years was probably abnormal, okay? They've all come down. We've seen it with Zoom. We've seen it with Peloton. We've seen it with a lot of companies. And um, I think what the bank is seeing is massive opportunity for itself to literally use your money, and that's what it does. It uses your money to buy these shares um, at, a, at a point in time which suits them. So, yeah, that's why we interrogate them to make sure that uh, they are the right bank. It is the right sort of set of, um, set of metrics. Let's have a look just very, very quickly. Um, Amazon, it's kind of been in the news today. I don't know if, you've, if any of you realize. Um, I think last week, they did announce it in March of this year that they were going to do a share split. In other words, they were going to take their share, issue shares and say, right, for every share that you got, we're going to dilute the value, well, not dilute the value, dilute the number of shares and do a, a share split, a stock split. So if you're holding one, you now get 20, but at a lower value. The only reason they do this is to create more liquidity in the market. Amazon was selling for over $2,000 a share. They're now selling for 122. What does that mean? More people can buy them, okay? Because it's more affordable. Not everybody's got $2,000, a bit like a note. Um, not everybody's got a million dollars to go to directly to an investment bank, but through cash box you can. So it's a nice analogy. But yeah, it's, it's happened. And a lot of companies are going to be doing that. Uh, Apple has said they're going to be doing it. Tesla are going to be doing it again, et cetera, et cetera. But what I see here is more importantly, and, and there's a line, thank you, Chad. He's drawn them on each of these charts, a little red line. That's really where the normal behavior of the share should have been. 2020 and 2021 were irrational years in terms of how valuations happened, how companies behaved, and how investor sentiment behaved. It went out the window. Believe you me, um, I've done a lot of valuations over the years of companies, and stockbroking, and financial analysis. And the rule books were thrown up. People did some very strange things. But some of these companies went to valuations that were out of sync with their earnings. Okay, They weren't really strong enough. But these are great companies. I mean, Jeff Bezos is still a great businessman. He's still you know, doing great things, even though he's sort of taken a little bit of a step aside. Um, Etsy, is, is, it really was a pandemic, darling. Came out of nowhere. But it is well positioned. In all these companies, the management teams, the, their future steerance, uh, beg your pardon, their future guidance, guidance and steerings on earnings uh, is very, very important. Um, their market share, they're all pretty much household names in their spaces. If we go to the next two, and you'll see a very, very similar pattern in terms of what the, the charts look like. PayPal, great opportunity to, grow, to buy 
literally, I suppose, the inventor, the originator of automated digital payments around the world. Um, we've included PayPal in some other recent um, e-commerce type of uh, lendings, issuances. And again, pretty much dominant in that space. Probably the smallest of these companies is Wayfair. It's an American company dedicated mainly in the, U the U.S., but certainly, I think what you'll see is all those, all these, these, these stochastics of these companies show a very similar trend that there's great opportunity for the bank now. What's in it for the bank? The bank is going to buy these companies as options and sell them at a later stage. That's something we can chat about. But it's a great story. This is our third issuance of a guaranteed income product this year. Because a lot of people are looking for that security. They're looking for finding Nemo, finding their yield, and not worrying about what happens ultimately. So these particular companies, I'm going to hand over to Chad shortly. These particular companies, literally, irrespective of what they do, and this is really, really important to get your head around this, the bank has underwritten those guaranteed returns, irrespective of what these companies do. Um, it's only at the very end of this term of four years or 48 months that it really becomes important as long as they are above half of what they started at full capital is returned as well. So this is a guaranteed income. This is somebody who wants income stream nonstop into their business, into their personal life for cash flow, for their PL, for whatever. This is a fixed deposit. I call it a fixed deposit on, on super steroids. It really is a fantastic product for me. The bank doesn't want to pay the cost of this income for too long. And that is why, Chad will explain, after 12 months, if these four companies at great discounts at the moment, back to kind of where they were, if they are producing or if they're at, at a price equal to or higher than their starting price at the end of this month, the bank will call this product, in other words, it early matures. So that your risk is that you might only get 12 months or four quarters of income, and then the bank calls the product in if the T's and C's are satisfied. So I saw that a client, if you can get 12% in dollars, 11.2 in sterling, and you're a cash client, bond client, or a dividend client without the risk, thank you for coming. And with that, I'm going to give it to Chad. All right, cool. Andrew, thank Boom. you. <laughs> Always good to listen. I must take off my shirt now, right? Jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So, folks, the good news, uh, BBVA Bank being uh, a very large Spanish bank, all the ratings that we need, we're very, very comfortable uh, to loan them our cash, and we've done the credit checks, we're comfortable with where they're at. As Andrea said, this particular note, and congrats to Andrea and IDAD for creating this, it's a fixed income product. It will pay out, if you take a pound-based product, 2.8% each quarter giving you 11.2 for the year or in pound or dollars. You can also do that in dollars if you prefer at 3% a quarter, giving us 12% per annum. This is guaranteed irrespective of what those stocks are going to do. And I'm going to explain in a graph just now what the bank's thinking is and how it is that they're going to make money. So we're going to drop down two rows. This product is going to run for a minimum of 12 months. When that auto call is put in place, this is the bank's position where if the stocks have risen in value and they can make money, they'll close the product early. So the minimum is 12 months, but the maximum period is four years should they need the full period. We think this product is going to do 12 to 18 months and probably then close out. Now, all that needs to happen on that auto call level is those stocks need to be at or above their start price at the beginning of the product. And again, I'll show you on a graph now. So quite simply, we don't need stellar growth. We just need strong, stable stocks in order to, for the bank to make money and to produce a return for us. The reference basket, as Andrew said, is indicated. The capital is protected by the bank for the life of the product until the very last observation, at which point we may be at capital risk. I'm going to show you how this works. It's highly unlikely, but it's important to understand what the terms and conditions say in the contract. This product's available um, in both dollar and in pound, as you see. It's available to purchase up until the 24th of June or 
until we reach full subscription by value. So the bank gave us a number that we need to generate a product with as a base, and they've given us a, a maximum cap. So anybody that's interested in the product, please let us know, either Jill at Cashbox or support at cashbox.global or Andrew or myself will allocate a portion to you. Once we hit full sub subscription, that currency may close or both may close, but the closing date is the 24th of June. The minimum investment is 10,000 of either currency uh, to come into the product. And now what's amazing is it takes about 500,000 to a million dollars, depending on the type of product to create one. And as Andrew said, what's been great is we've been able to democratize and bring this uh, term or this, this quantum down to 10,000. Thanks, Jill. So on the fact sheet, which is available on our website, you'll see under the available products, it's there if you'd like to get it, or you could ask us, we could send it to you. You're going to have the observation dates. So the product's going to go live on the defined date. On the 6th of October, we'll do an observation, but it has no impact um, on the coupon. The coupon will flow from BBVA Bank to your platform exactly on the 6th of October. So it'll probably appear on your platform two days later there, thereabouts. As you can see on the right-hand side, the auto call isn't available yet. It's only available from the fourth observation, which means you're gonna get a guaranteed flow of income for the minimum of, of one year. Should the stocks be again at 100% of their start price or four or more or higher, the bank will at that point then be able to profit from the share rise. They'll close the product out. They'll return our full capital. Now, typically, we go through an auto call before the, the full term of the product. And I'll take you through a graph to explain that in a sec. Thanks, Jill. All righty. So we're going to run through what may happen through the life of a product just from a, a graph point of view might be easier to understand this from a picture again. So we look at the quarters that travel. We go quarter one, two, three, four, five uh, through the life of the product, right? What's going to happen when the product starts? At the start date, we're going to measure the value of the underlying uh, shares. That's called our strike date. Those shares then get measured each quarter. doesn't matter what happens now at all. The bank is guaranteeing to pay us every single coupon as it runs. When will it stop? It will stop when either the product's reached its full term, or if you have a look at the auto call, where the shares have risen above the auto call mark, if you wouldn't mind showing us there, Jill, you can see the auto call uh, is in place from quarter four onwards. And as soon as all the shares are at or above that start price from quarter four onwards, it will close out. So it's highly likely that this product will close up within a year, year and a half there, thereabouts. Um, in the unlikely event, which will be the sorry, next slide. Uh -huh. Sorry, Chad, we have a question. Oh, great. Uh, I can't see it. Um, no, it's not in the chat. Um, it's a mead. Adam, Adam Mead. Yeah. yeah, good. Good, uh, good afternoon. Um, everyone can see me. Yes. Hello. Okay, well, for some reason, my name uh, shows Adam Mide. That's my son's <laughs> name. I think he's been using my uh, Zoom. But my name is Sean, and I'm the CEO of Pierpont Capital. Great. Um, I got uh, this reference from uh, Okorian. And um, thank you for the presentation. I just have a number of questions. Um, I don't know if this is a good time or I should wait till you finish your presentation. So how, how do you want us to do this? Um, I would love to answer all your questions. Okay. Or not myself. Okay, I'll just try to run very quickly then. So there are two things. There's a principle and yes. then there's the yield. Yes. In terms of protection, yes. do we get a 100% cover on both the principle and the yield or uh, is it is it just one or the other? No, so it is a bit of both. Lovely question. Thank you very much. So the yield is guaranteed by BBVA Bank. This is a contract from the bank to us. And um, as you know, the only way to access this, and I'll show you a little further down the, the slides, is through an online investment platform. 
that is regulated that the investment bank is happy to um, interact with. So against that fact sheet, the, the income will flow through the life of the product. Now, what's going to happen? Do you see the products then designed to auto call? It auto calls when the bank has the opportunity to exercise the options. They're going to sell those shares at a higher value and then sell it back into the investment bank. This is how they're able to cover the cost of borrowed capital from us. And they would then return the full capital back to us via the investment platform exactly on that payment date. So if we've just looked at the last five-year period, for example, all the income generating structured notes that we've been involved with that IDAT have created, who are our partners, um, they've all auto-called as designed before hitting full maturity. While the product is running, the bank has guaranteed and is underwriting our capital. Now, let's go and have a look at what the T's and C's say in the next event. Um, let's say one of these shares runs below auto call level. Sorry, Chad. I'm busy answering a question. <laughs> Can you flip the slide? I'll get to the European barrier. Okay, the next slide is... Oh, dear. Okay, sorry. Um, we, 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 did you change the, the... Okay. slide format? Jill, could you go back one, and then I'm going to ask you to use your red marker for me while I chat. So what might happen? Let's say one share runs, but it runs at 10% less than it started for the life of the product. So if we follow Jill's cursor, this line runs at 10% below and it runs right until quarter 16. Um, what would happen in the definitions in this product, the capital is protected to a 50% barrier. What does this mean? Even if one or more of these shares goes down all the way to 50% of its start price. In other words, these quality products halve in value and they run to full term. I would have collected every coupon as it's traveled. And mm -hmm. even if it's dropped by 50%, the bank will pay me back my full capital. Isn't that phenomenal? Okay. However, in the very next situation, and this has not happened, but it's contracted in. If, for example, one of that, of the four in the basket closes at say 45% of its start price. I will get out 45% of my capital. It would be as if I'd owned that share directly. So you'll see in the contract, the capital is, is underwritten by the bank for the life of the product, but it's not capital protected because of this very last observation. This has not happened, but it's contractually put into the terms and conditions. We understand what could happen, right? So we've, we've got uh, two levels of protection, three levels really. A, who we're contracting with, who's this bank. The capital is protected for the life. The income is, is guaranteed to pay out uh, through the life of the product. And then the very last observation, which we're unlikely to see, is where I might have to uh, utilize the capital protection barrier. And there my capital, I'll get full capital out at or above 50%. I'd get out what the market um, is worth should it be below 50%. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. And and then, sorry, uh, sorry, one second. Um, Nalika, does that answer your question? So that is what a 50% European style um, at maturity means. Yeah. So the banks love using big terms um, and exactly that. So the European style means the very last observation at the end of the product's life. Okay, so basically in the event of um, the worst case scenario, we only start to stand to lose about 50% of, of the capital investment invested. Anything that, so in each note, you'll see we have a capital protection barrier built in. So sometimes they float. You could have a 60% or 50%. Um, we'd check on each product. But in this particular one, I'm going to get 100% of my capital out so long as all the stocks are above 50% of their start price. Phenomenal. Massive right. amount of insurance. Okay. Now, it then seems to me that the guarantees by the bank, um, yeah. which is provided the uh, underwriting, 
Yes. Um, which means there would be um, some sort of due diligence on those banks as well. Do you have an idea of the volume of structured notes in this case that those banks are sitting on? Um, Ed, I can, I, yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, good question. Um, at any one stage, Cashbox itself does not do the due diligence uh, on the banks itself. Um, that is underwritten, or this bigger part, and that analysis is done by um, IDAD, which is a probably the preeminent leading structured note provider. At any one point, they've got between, I, I don't, Graham's not on the line this evening, he's our, he's, he talks to us from IDAD, works with us very closely. It's generally anything between 30 and 35 um, tier one A rated banks. And look, let, let's be realistic. Um, we, we call them A-rated banks for a very good reason, because I think following the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, the global financial meltdown, uh, many banks uh, were found wanting, and some of the Fitch and S&P and Moody's ratings didn't actually stand up. I think the governance and due diligence on those banks is now exceptionally high. Um, when a bank, uh, and we will only deal with a tier one A-rated bank, when a bank underwrites an issue, you must understand the issuance, it's a debt issuance, and it's written off the balance sheet. It's a little bit technical, but it's written off the balance sheet of the company. So in other words, that's under that could go to shareholder scrutiny. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it has to pass a number of different checks within the bank itself. Investment banks are, uh, I, mean, I mean, they've been portrayed in, uh, I think in Hollywood as, you know, the, the Wolf of Wall Street and all sorts of movies as, as, <laughs> As, as, as pretty despicable people. I've worked for investment banks over the years in Switzerland, the UK, and South Africa. Um, and yes, they're there to make money. They're very profitable centers. But because of what happened in 2000, 2009, 2008, 2009, credit committees, investment committees, senior ex it has to be signed off because it basically becomes a liability. So when a company reports its um, total asset base, it has to report liabilities because those liabilities are owed um, mm -hmm. in total assets. Um, so it's, it's very, very, it's probably the biggest risk, I believe, that an investor contracts in a structured note. I'll be very blunt with you. Mm -hmm. And that is why we will not deal with a B-rated bank, a triple B-rated bank. There's some great, fantastic banks around the world that unfortunately should be in that tier, in that level, but because of their sovereign position, mm -hmm. um, I'll take a bank like Investec Bank. It's, it's a well-known bank in South Africa. It's a well-known bank globally. It's got a triple B rating because that's the sovereign rating of South Africa. Unfortunately, we won't deal with it. We'll never have an issuance off, off, off their balance sheet. So we will only deal with a very large household name type of banks that have ex had experience in this particular field as well. And not all banks, um, at a particular point, want to be in a particular structured note. The French banks, for example, of which we do business with, they, um, they are very keen on Southeast Asia. Uh, so they're keen on Brazil, Latin America, et cetera. The American banks like to keep it in America. So the Goldman Sachs, the Morgan Stanley's, the cities who dealt with Citibank, they like to keep American type of issuances. So they will underwrite something that's got John Deere, Caterpillar, IBM, Boeing, you know, you name it, Harley Davidson, it because they know America, and then the European banks uh, is where I think we get the the sort of sweet spot, if I can call it that. Um, the UK banks and the and the European banks. This particular bank, BBVA, has an issuance of something like uh, on this particular every year, the exco of a bank will say, right, guys, the investment bank has to make so much money for its shareholders, and we are allow you to write debt in a structured product or any other product, and you have a pot of money. Um, this particular one, I think, um, BBDA has an issuance. I think I can check it up on the term sheet, but I think it's something in the region of 60 million euros, okay, mm -hmm. um, okay. in, this, partic in this, particular, this particular four days. So they've taken 60 million euros, and they said, right, uh, being a French bank, I've denominated back to Europe. They said, that is your debt issuance for this point in time unless it's proving very profitable for the bank and then we'll give you more. Mm. So um, BBVA is very aggressive in the space. Goldman Sachs is aggressive. Barclays, 
Mm. Um, it's a great generator of business for the bank. But mm. as Chad says, these are not retail type of returns. Yeah. This is in the space of the ultra high net worth type of return, institutional type of return. Mm. Okay. Then my final question, it's, it's literally two in one. Um, so just to, just to allow others to be able to ask questions as well. Um, it has to do with basically, um, first, is there a secondary market in terms of liquidity uh, for this product? So i.e. one is coming in for four years. If one has to get out maybe in three, four months or whatever, is that possible? Vis-a-vis -vis when you look at the situation in the US now, because depending on who you speak with, with everything that is happening in the world, you did talk about the headwinds. Um, inflation, inflation, inflation. I think that's a message coming out of the US. And that has a very negative impact for the stock market, coupled to the fact that we all don't know what's going to happen uh, tomorrow or the day after. So in a situation where you have a continuing bearish market, what happens? How, how liquid is this product if one has to cut, cut its losses? Okay, I'll take that question as well. Yeah, so as Chad mentioned, this is a contractual, there's terms and conditions, it's a contract that the bank issues. So in other words, it's a legal obligation by the bank to provide you the contracted yield, in both sterling and dollars, to provide the protection in terms of the capital values until, until the, the final observation and then to repay the, the, the capital. The term is four years. The bank has the call, the opportunity to recall it in terms of the terms and conditions from one year onwards, if those shares have risen, if they've obeyed and ticked off the boxes in the terms and conditions. So it's all set in stone. There's no surprises. So should there be a situation in an investor's life where his circumstances change, his liquidity changes, and he says, well, I need to just redeem this, uh, this investment. I need to get up the secondary market, as you call it. Effectively, he's breaking the contract. That's what it amounts to. It's a contract between the bank and your platform through which you're investing. So depending on where the actual levels are of, the, of those underlying companies, Mm -hmm. um, it could be at a discount where it started, and then you will get out at that discount. Okay. Right. okay. Obviously, if there's a situation where, the, the, if, if it's risen, obviously it would have auto called. Mm -hmm. So we're really looking at the negative situation of what happens if um, the markets have, uh, the companies have just gone sideways, they're 10 or 15% below what they started. That's effectively what the actual value, the par value is looking at. Mm -hmm. the par value being we started at naught we minus 15 now yeah. we want to break the contract and get out the question is is there a secondary market for that liquidity to flow back to the client and that's where you will find players in the market will say that's fine it's minus 15 we'll provide the liquidity we'll buy you out there's no obligation on the bank to buy you out there's no obligation from anybody to buy you out mm -hmm. literally you'll have the, the, a secondary market will present itself and say Right. We'll give you your cash, but it's at minus 20, not minus 15. So they're getting an extra discount. So that market does exist. But there's no contractual obligation, for example, like in a mutual fund relationship, where the, the company, if you're in a unit trust or a mutual fund, they are obliged within 48 hours or within their certain trading days to buy you out at what the selling price is. This is a free float situation, and you might be looking for a client. You might be looking for a, a, a buyer of your position for a week, a month, it could be longer. So that is, I say to a client, if you get into a situation, if this is discretionary funds, if these are discretionary monies, okay, they, they shouldn't be like, well, I might need these for my school fees or for my business, ca business cash flow in six to 12 or 18 months time. Mm -hmm. These are funds that you can effectively say, right, I'm buying a cash flow stream for four years. Mm -hmm. I'm locking it in. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the short answer. Okay. All right. Great Thank questions. You. Yeah, very, very good questions. Super. Jill, um, let's move on. And then okay. I'd so, encourage you. Okay, so just two, two quick questions that were asked, and I've answered them, but I just thought I'd let everyone know. Um, so one question was, if one share stays below 50%, but the other three um, above, does the total capital get reduced by 50%? 
Yes, we always track the, lot, the, the worst performing stock. So it doesn't really matter what the other ones are doing. We just look at what the worst performing one is doing. And then the second question is the quarterly income distributed as income or dividend? I'm assuming it's tax. You're talking about tax and it's treated as income, not as a dividend. So those are the two questions. And then, of course, your trading platform that you use would produce a um, tax report for you in the, the, the periods that you choose. So uh, a proper platform does a good job of that as well. Yep. Thanks, Jill. Okay. All right. So um, in summary, the bank has to be comfortable that the uh, stock options that they're going to buy has the potential to cover the cost of the borrowed money. Because often people say to us, hey, but listen, if I can get only 2% of the bank, how are they making their money? They're making the money on that, the growth in the underlying um, stocks. They've used our money to buy those options. So it's really uh, everything above that is, is theirs and it's for free. Uh, sorry, highly profitable. The investor, of course, we need to be comfortable, A, in the strength of the bank and that the, the stocks that are chosen have a really good story. And as we can see, we see value and that they're not going to halve in value again. Um, so what's been chosen, this is the bank also looking at this saying, yes, we want to put these stocks into our business uh, from a year, from, in a year from now. And uh, we believe we can go and make money. So yeah, clean and simple. Thanks, Jill. And now here's Andrew's famous slide. Oh, wait, before, tax reports. Um, well, could this also include all the different fees we paid? Yes, yes. So, Pierre, your, your tax report will take off um, fees, et cetera, that you are paying. Um, so uh, for the ones that I'm familiar with, you put in your tax jurisdiction, you put the currency that you want your report to convert into. So you can have multiple currencies, multiple assets. Um, they will do all the numbers and then produce what was income, what was, what was growth. Uh, you just want to double check all the other fees. You're quite right. Um, and that I'm sure your accountant could help you with. And then just to add to that, um, in terms of the product, the returns that are quoted are net of fees. And you've got a hundred percent allocation. So the, you know, the um, eleven point eleven point two percent on sterling is that's what you get. There's no, there's nothing deducted off that. The only fees are the fees from your platform. Yeah, and your, as you know, your platform could charge you a quarterly fee, a monthly fee, or an annual fee that that you would check. Um, and there's a whole list of platforms um, that are probably popular within our community. If you if you are looking, we can help you through that. Okay. Any other questions? Come on, there's got to be one more. <laughs> okay, I'll take I'll, I'll take the shot. Cool. Um, how do you select your portfolio, and what's the criteria? Can I do? Can I answer this and then I'll ask Andrew to finish or do it properly? But um, what is stunning with structured notes uh, is because we're producing a structured note every three to six weeks, depending on the market condition. There'll be different stocks that are in in those baskets that the bank believe show potential. Now, not to shoot the lights up, but steady, strong, strong stocks. So. I could go into a $10,000, for example, perhaps it is that I could take an allocation of some of money and actually build a portfolio of structured notes. So I could, I could go into one as they came up, for example, or into those that I like. So perhaps this one speaks to me because I want to create a defined income. Now, do you see I get a, a defined income? It's capped, right? The bank is going to go for the upside, but we, we're buying this really to protect us for the downside. So I might build a stream of income-based structured notes. We also create, interestingly, growth-based structured notes where the bank pays us out only when the product auto calls. We typically generate much larger returns that way because the bank isn't giving out cash before it's made its profit. So if you have a look on our website, a product that went live, uh, it struck last night, I think it is. No, it's uh, not. Tonight. That growth is set at 22% per annum. 
but it will only pay out once the product auto calls. So I can create a portfolio of structured nodes with both income and with growth, different currencies, which is really cool, and then maybe different issuing banks, and then the different um, stocks that may be in those underlying baskets. So I felt I'd put that in because Andrew is probably going to then focus on you know, what the thinking is per note, because a lot of work goes into what goes into a note. So I'm hoping that will give you something else to consider. Yeah, great question. Yeah, Chad, I think, yeah, Chad has very eloquently and articulately sort of positioned it. Um, as I mentioned, um, and thanks, Chad, banks are not charities. Um, they're not charitable foundations or institutions. But at the end of the day, a business, they're a business, and they're looking to, you know, whether it's achieving alpha or delta or beta or whatever it is in terms of their return. Uh, they're looking to create shareholder value. And there's a strategy. There's a strategy of very simply buying a value situation. And you saw some of those charts where there's in val it's in value territory, buying those options quite cheaply, using our money. We've interrogated them to make sure that the bank is good. The bank is solid and it's going to be around. It's not going to disappear. They use those to buy the options and they've got a strategy and that's why I said it goes through a credit committee, which is the first probably tier filter. Then it goes to the, the investment committee and they would decide, would we like Amazon? We would like Amazon at these share splits and would we like Etsy? Would we like uh, PayPal? Who are we going to sell these options to in a year's time or 18 months time? Uh, will we sell it to our private bankers, our unit trust guys, our mutual fund, our stockbrokers, our private bank. So there's another trade on the other side that the bank is thinking about. The bank will make money. Um, sure, there have been occasions, and I've been involved with structured notes um, through the UK and Switzerland in the last 20 years, where banks have had to pay a high price for a contract that they've been indebted to, and they haven't been able to get out of it early through an auto call. And they pay, they pay a high price for that. But 80%, and I'm using that number judiciously for the banks I've worked for, the 80% benchmark is that they will auto call early. That the bank will get out. It's attracted a huge amount of money. It's paid a premium for it, but it's now going to on sell those and make profits that will more than compensate for the coupons that it's paid the investor. So these are traditional structures that are used by family offices, high net worth individuals, and ultra high net worth individuals. And at levels that you just don't see coming in the retail space, unfortunately. Um, and that's what Chad mentioned earlier. One of the tenets of Cashbox is to democratize this investment as an asset class where you don't need a million or two million or three million dollars to approach a Credit Suisse or a Rabo Bank or a Goldman Sachs and say, can this be done? Andrew? The banks, them the banks themselves approach us and say, would you like to buy into this particular product? And we interrogate them and we say, no, we don't want a 65 or 75% protection level. We want as deep as possible. Um, I believe as, as, as an individual that structured notes, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not being, uh, what's the word, sarcastic, they are more developed for a bearish market. So you talk about the headwinds that you, you mentioned, inflation, 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 100% agree with you. I'm on the same, uh, same song sheet as that. Even recession, that, that could be another big headwind. But certainly, these type of defined contracts give you certainty in this uncertain word, and it's very unpredictable, and we're trying to create predictability. Andrew, was the question more what goes into choosing the underlying assets? Is that more the question? Yeah, so, okay, if I answer that very quickly, because it's technical. Um, yeah. yeah, if it's a thematic, if, let's say e-commerce, it could be electric vehicles, it could be global miners, it could be commodities, it could be uh, staple foods. The company itself, so these particular companies have not been identified by Cashbox, by myself. Uh, well, I'd add, this is the bank who is thinking in terms of thematically and in terms of valuations. And this is where quantitative and, qualita quantitative and qualitative analytics get involved. And they've got all the propeller heads sitting there, they employ these rock stars at huge expenses. They put together thematic themes where they are projecting forward to say, electric vehicles is going to be a theme we need to get in now. Green energy, uh, staple food, cybersecurity. There's a host of different themes 
And some of them are mega trends that come through very, very strongly in terms of that, what we were starting to experience before the pandemic just got squashed together, concertina together, and the future suddenly we were living in it all became sort of day-to-day -day stuff. It's all accepted normality now. So a lot of those themes, a lot of that analysis is done by the bank itself, okay? And I did mention earlier, some of the banks are very concentrated on certain sectors. Maybe it be, maybe it be in the market. They may be concentrating on certain geographic sectors. I mentioned the French banks. Um, and some of the banks are very sort of, um, how can I call it, um, homegrown. They want to stay within the, for example, the American banks love underwriting American debt when it's got, you know, I mentioned, you know, Caterpillar and John Deere and, you know, uh, Harvest International, great Boeing, great American companies. They're happy to do that because it's something they come comfortable with. They're very close to management. They can interrogate those quarterly steerings, GO reports, everything. So we are to a degree, um, uh, we can go with a completely bespoke, tailor-made. We can go to the bank. We did it this year. I'll give you an example. We went to Goldman Sachs. We went to City, and we said, can you underwrite a note um, that is going to mirror and benefit from the American infrastructure bill, the rebuilding of America under Biden? in terms of infrastructure, roads, railways, bridges, et cetera. And we put some staple companies in there. So we, we, we cooperated very, very closely with them in terms of the bank, in terms of let's understand Caterpillar or Nucor or US Steel. You know, you've got to use steel, you've got to use cement, you've got to use things to build. And um, it's, again, that particular note um, was underwritten. It's about halfway through. Um, all those stocks are well above their start price. So at the way it's going, it will, it, it, will, it will call after 12 months, which is according to its T's and C's. But again, the bank itself interrogated. We had clients who said, we want this play. We want to participate in this trend that's coming through the States. And everybody climbed on the back of it when the infrastructure bill was you know, put into law in the, in, in the first quarter of, of 2022. So there are trends that we participate in. The, the bank comes to us and they'll say as well, they'll say, this is what we believe it's going. And often the, the terms and conditions don't suit us in terms of we've always gone for deep protection an institutional type of return and, and, and great protection from start to finish, quite frankly. And the bank is really important to us. We've got a great relationship with our structure. And in turn, they have a great relationship with the dealing desks of these probably 35 banks located uh, around the world. Graham McCallion, who's normally on our calls, I know he's in the UK tonight. He's normally based on the Isle of Man. Uh, he normally participates on a call, and he would probably fill that with far more accomplishment than, than I've tried to. But if you'd like to take it further, we can certainly chat offline. Okay, thank you. So are there any more questions? Is everybody good? All good, thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, Jill, I'm sure people can get hold of us, eh? All right, go, Andrew, yeah. look at you. <laughs> That's the money shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so for any other questions, if you'll just drop a mail through to um, either me, which is Jill with a G, at cashbox.global, or through to support at cashbox.global, Sorry, Andrew, I have to move on your slide. Um, for basically any, any questions or if you do actually want to take a closer look at the note, if you don't already follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook or Facebook, um, you're welcome to join us. We post a lot of information on there and you kind of keep, keep up to date with what's going on. And with that, and if there are no more questions, um, we'll be in touch. I will send, we all will send through the recording to everyone whose who's, um, contact details we do have and thank you so much for joining us cool. thanks Jill nice to see everybody good evening thanks thanks everybody bye. cheers there bye, bye. 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 bye.